Praise the Lord, everyone. It is good to see you. You can't hear me. There we go. Now we have sound. It is good to see everybody this evening. God bless you all for coming in on this rainy evening. And to all of you on Facebook, it is good to see you as well. Not literally, but it's good to see you joining in with your comments, your likes and loves. Praise the Lord to all of you as well. Amen. Before we enter into a, a, a time of prayer, before we begin, I want to um, remind you of this weekend, for those of you who have heard or maybe not heard, uh, Marvin Williams passed away. Um last week, and I still do not know the exact day of his death, but the viewing is this Friday evening. I sent an email to the church, so you should have got this. For those of you who may be watching online, you don't have email. The viewing is this Friday evening in West Columbia at E. Viola Funeral Home in West Columbia from 5 to 7, and then the funeral is Saturday morning at 10 a.m., at Jefferson Street Church of Christ there also in West Columbia. And Bishop and I have been asked to conduct a service, so we're um, going to be doing that Saturday morning. So please keep the Williams and the Wright families in your prayers. And God will comfort them during this time. Amen. And I would ask that you would pray for God to give me wisdom be able to speak what he wants me to say, to remember Marvin, but also to speak what he wants me to say to his family, because at a time like that, you're ministering to the living, and so that's what we want to do, so please be in prayer about that, amen. And this Sunday, being the first Sunday of the month, it will be Missions Sunday, so please keep that in your in mind as well. And as we go forward, this is the time of the year when we are preparing to send in our offering for I Am Global. This is the offering Sister Shirley talked about uh, in November. This is in regards to the missionaries who are on deputation. And if every church in the United Pentecostal Church International, if every church sends in a minimum of $1,200, and they are able to get as many missionaries off deputation and back to the field. But sometimes those deputations take up to 18 months, sometimes longer, three, four years, to raise their budget, and they're traveling around the country trying to raise their budget. So please pray and ask the Lord what he, what he would have you to give for that. Um, if we give twelve hundred dollars, at least the minimum, that would be a great blessing to the missionaries as they head back to their field of labor. So please keep that in mind as well. Amen. If you would stand with me and let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want us to pray for a, a moment or two here as we get ready to enter into the Word of the Lord. I do have a word from God that He gave to me um, earlier this week. So I'm excited to share this with you tonight, but I want us to enter into a place where we are. God's word is supernatural. It's, it's inspired by God. Therefore, the only way we can receive this word is via the same spirit that authored it. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, just remember these different things that we're praying about, but let's enter in. Uh, with an open heart and an open mind. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come boldly to the throne of grace. God, we enter in with confidence. We enter in, O oh Lord, with knowledge that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. We enter in, O oh Lord, knowing tonight that the Word of God is clear. The Word of God, the Logos, the written Word, O oh Lord, is very clear to us that if we seek after you with all of our heart, then we will find you. And so tonight, O oh Lord, we are joining together in one mind and one accord. God, as we prepare ourselves for the word, we prepare our minds, we prepare our hearts. God, we prepare our spirit, soul, and body so that we may be able to hear what the spirit is saying. 
And God, right now, I pray you would search every one of our hearts. See if there be any wicked way. See if there be any sinful way in me, O Lord. See if there be any hindrance, any blockage, O Lord. And God, right now, I forgive and I release. I let go of everything. I forgive myself, Lord. I forgive others. Lord, I forgive even you, O Lord, for whatever reason. I may be holding a grudge tonight, Father. I release it. I let it go. And God, I repent before you of anything, any hindrances. God, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, O Lord. I repent for every wrong, every word, every deed, every thought, every desire. God, I repent before you, O Lord, from lust and pride and greed and hatred and bitterness and envy and strife, O Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I pray that cleansing flow over me, O Lord. Spirit, soul, and body in Jesus' name. And God, I cast every care upon you. God, every bit of fear, doubt, and unbelief, any worry, any uncertainty, O Lord. God, my care about tomorrow, what will be on the morrow, Lord, I give that to you as well, Father. Right now, O Lord, the only thing I want to hold on to is your presence, Lord, the flow of the Spirit in me. God, I turn loose of everything, even my own will right now. I submit my will to your will, my desires to your desires, the mind of Christ, I receive it. God, in exchange, I give you my mind, O Lord. I take your heart, Father, and I give you mine, Lord. In the name of Jesus, God, that I may hear and that I may receive, O Lord. Yes, I will speak this word, O Lord, but I too, God, am opening my heart to hear and receive what you haven't said today, O Lord, but what you will say as this word goes forth. In the name of Jesus, and God, I speak. For every one of these people that are here tonight, they've made the effort to come out into the rain, O oh Lord, to be in this building, to gather together in worship. And I pray your strength in their bodies right now, their minds, their hearts, their spirits, to be renewed in the name of the Lord Jesus. God, that when we leave this place, O oh Lord, our bodies may be tired, but our spirit man energized and renewed through the power of the Spirit, Lord. I pray these things with knowledge and understanding of your word that you are who you say you are and you will do, Lord, what you say you will do. And God, we bless you. We honor you. We, uh, we lift up your mighty name, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus, giving all glory and honor unto the only wise King. O oh Lord, I bless you now in Jesus' name. In the name of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Thank you for joining with me in prayer. Amen. Again, it is good to see all of you tonight. God bless you for being here. Amen, and for those special ones who just celebrated a birthday, and you know who you are, happy birthday. Amen, and congratulations on the new ride. Amen. And all the goodies that went along with that, amen, congratulations. Praise the Lord. If you will turn with me to the book of First Peter. We are continuing the series, The Ministry of the Saints. At first glance, it may not seem tonight that we are um, following this series, but we are. Uh, and so we want to continue this as long as the Lord is leading in this direction. When we started this now five weeks ago, we, we began with the book of Acts chapter 2. I know I alluded to this Sunday morning, but right now, this is the flow that I am in. This is where God has me and everything, almost everything that he is showing me right now is in this vein or this flow of the ministry of the saints. And we, we began in Acts chapter 2 the very first week we talked about this, that those people who were born again on the day of Pentecost continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. 
And the, the apostles' doctrine we found out was they continued in breaking of bread, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And then we find that they were also continuing daily with one accord in the temple. Daily they were in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart. And then we went to Ephesians chapter 4 where we read about the fivefold ministry that, that apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers are for the perfecting of the saints. For the, for the work of the ministry, for the perfecting of the saints. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then it continues. Then we went back to Ephesians chapter 1. Two weeks in a row, we went there. All One of those Wednesdays was all online. Uh, recorded it earlier in the day. But we found out that the body of Christ, it is the church. This is the saints. These are the people of God. These are the born-again believers in Jesus and as saints of God, we are members of this larger body of Christ. And therefore, the body of Christ is to do whatever Jesus Christ did when he walked the earth. The ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. Tonight, we're going to pick up that theme, that thought tonight, that whatever Christ was, and whatever Christ did in the earth, this is also our ministry. At first glance, you may not appreciate this, but it still is our ministry. So let's read from 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse number 1, the Bible says this, For as much then as Christ hath, what? Suffered. Told you you wouldn't like it. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. Now that word arm there is, in case you think this is familiar, it is because we, 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 we covered this back when we were doing, when we were preaching or teaching on patience. But just... Just hang on because this it gets even better. But that to arm yourselves with the same mind is also in the same connotation as if to arm yourselves with a weapon. Go to your weapons closet, if you please, and arm yourself to put on your sidearm, if you please, or put your rifle over your shoulder. It is or your sword, your sword of the spirit. It is a weapon. The mind of Christ is a weapon. He said, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now let's drop down to verse number 12, and this, will, this is where we'll take our text from before we uh, go any further. Let's read this beginning at verse number 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, that word reproach means to be blasphemed or to be reviled for them to drag your name through the mud as it were if you are reproached or your own name is blasphemed for the name of Christ happy are you that word is blessed in the beatitudes blessed are ye this is the same word for the spirit of glory listen all of this ties together from Sunday morning Wednesday before 
the Wednesday before that, all of this ties together. He said, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part, those who are reviling and and reproaching you, the Lord Jesus is evil spoken of. But on your part, when they revile your name, when they when they drag your name through the mud, as it were, Jesus Christ is glorified. I told you, you wouldn't like it. Why? Because Jesus Christ is glorified in suffering, which is what happened when he walked the earth for three and a half years. Jesus' ministry was not appreciated. He was not accepted. He wasn't in the in crowd. He wasn't hip with the world. He stood out against the world. He stood out against the religious. Therefore, Christ, when when it came to the end of his ministry, he suffered because of what he believed and how he lived and who he was only willing to, to, to glorify. He wasn't willing to glorify himself. He wasn't willing to glorify the world and the people in the world. He had only one mission in mind, and that was to glorify his Father, which was in heaven. And in glorifying God, which was in heaven, therefore, he put a mark upon himself, a big big crosshairs on his chest or on his back that said, you are marked and you are going to die. You're going to suffer because of what you believe. Paul or Peter is telling us that when we are reproached and we are reviled, he says we we should be happy about that. And God is glorified. The Lord Jesus is glorified when that happens. Why? Because the spirit of glory, and this is the same spirit of glory that that I read to you Sunday morning from John chapter 16. Jesus said that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, same spirit, that the spirit of truth would come. He would take what belonged to the Lord Jesus and he would give it to us through the power of the spirit. So the ministry of Christ was transferred to us when we received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. As I said Sunday morning, now if you are born again of water and spirit, you are bought with a price. You're not your own anymore. You don't belong to yourself anymore. Now it's not up to you to make choices and decisions based on what You and I want to do. We can't do that now. Because if we make choices and decisions that God is not authoring, what is it? It's iniquity. And Jesus said to those in John 7, 21 through 23, even though they cast out devils in his name, although they did many wonderful, mighty works in his name, what did Jesus say? At, that, at the day of judgment, he said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, because he said, I never knew you. Why did he not know them? And I, I looked this up. I've heard Bishop Wright say this a number of times, but I found it for myself. It means that he simply did not have a proper relationship with them, one at least that he approved of. So the whole point is this, that when Jesus Christ lived and walked the earth, He lived for one purpose, and that was to find, know, and do the will of his Father. And it did not matter what it cost him. When he found the will of God every day, and he he knew it, it means it got into his spirit, so that when he got up from where he was, and he went out into the world to do the will of his Father was his only mission. Nothing more, nothing less. And when he did that, as I've stated it a number of times, and 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 as a teacher, for if you uh, for those teachers that are watching, uh, there's any school former school teachers in the room tonight? Perhaps not, but you know that when you are teaching a lesson, especially in Sunday school, Sister Jean, when you're teaching, repetition is what causes them to remember it, to get it into their mind, and then. Eventually, it makes its way into their spirit. It's repetition. So I'm saying it again tonight, that doing the will of the Father puts a mark upon us, and the world does not appreciate us. Jesus said it in John chapter 17. He says, Lord, when he was praying, he said, the world already hates them. He was talking about Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the eleven. 
that were with him in the garden that night. He said, the world already hates them because they hated me. And tonight, as we're going to see, we, we, if we get this far, if we get that far, rather, that we're going to see this very plainly, that as Christ Jesus suffered in the flesh, if we are His body, if we are sons of God, if we intend to be part of His end-time apostolic worldwide harvest and revival, then the world is not going to appreciate our ministry. Is this something that you're willing to accept? Are we willing to accept our ministry in the light of what it really may cost us in the end? And you don't have to say amen tonight. Sunday morning was different, but you don't have to say amen tonight. It's okay. Because if you're not saying amen, then I know I'm on the right track because this is, it digs deep into all of us. We are sons of God. Male or female, we are all sons of God. And as the body of Christ, as sons of God in the earth, our ministry is Jesus, or was Jesus' ministry. Everything that Christ did when He lived and walked the earth is what we are expected to be in and involve ourselves with between now and when Jesus comes. Verse 14 again, so if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. For the spirit of glory, that's, I'm sorry, I, brother, this is, this is really in my spirit tonight. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. The word for there is indicating, it's tying in the first part of that verse with the second part. You, you are happy because you're being reproached. Because or for the purpose of or for the reason behind it is that the Spirit of God is on you or is now in you. And on their part, he is God is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Now listen to these next two verses. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. And the thought continues, verse 16, yet if any man suffer as a Christian, why would he put the term Christian in the same list with murderers, thieves, evildoers, and busybodies? Because I'm going to tell you right now, I, I, I went and verified it again this evening. The term Christian for the early church was not a term that they thought of and pinned upon themselves. The term Christian was a, was a derogatory term that was given to those who believed in Jesus Christ. When, when uh, was it King Agrippa that told Paul there when Paul was giving his testimony before him and, and at the end of it Agrippa trembled and he said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That wasn't a term of endearment. King Agrippa had a whole lot more at stake than anybody else had. And so to take on the term of a Christian, King Agrippa would have had to given up way too much, at least in his own estimation, to become one of those vile people, a Christian. Yeah, that's why that term Christian is included with murderers and thieves and evildoers and busybodies because that's how they thought about us. And guess what? It's going to come full circle. Right now, it's a pretty common thing to be called a Christian. You can go anywhere. You can go anywhere and find somebody who calls themselves a Christian. But when what we're studying tonight truly comes to pass, Will we still bear that title? Will we still be willing to bear that title? No matter what affliction, no matter what suffering comes towards us, even comes against us, maybe 
maybe not so much physically, but uh, it will be physical eventually. Spiritual attacks. Are, are, are you being spiritually attacked? Is your mind being touched? You have thoughts in your mind and you have meditations in the heart that you wonder where in the world did that come from? You can blame that on flesh all you want to, but we are first of all a spirit being. Paul put it in this order in 1 Thessalonians 5. He said that we are spirit, soul, and body in that order. So we are first of all a spiritual creature and we live under an atmosphere of spirit beings. Fallen spirit beings. The devil's angels, if you please. Not the ones on motorcycles either. We're talking about those spirits that you cannot see, but when they manifest themselves in your presence, you know it very quickly. But so the term Christian, he says, verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. What? When I, when I suffer persecution, I'm supposed to glorify God? I'm supposed to exalt in praise and adoration? I, I don't think I need to tell you, but I didn't write this. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to accept, but that's the case according to the Word of God. And all of this is being summed up now in these next three verses. Four, because the time is come. The time is now. And, and when this was written some 2,000 years ago, it was true then. And if it was true then, then it is, it is infinitely more true if it's possible for it to be that way now than it was then because we are now 2,000 years closer to the coming of the Lord and they thought He was coming back almost immediately. You read the book, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians, maybe chapter, maybe the Second Thessalonians, but one of those two books, Paul had to write to tell them that he, no, He hasn't come back yet, so don't listen to anybody who's telling you that He has. He says, for the time is now, the time is come, that judgment must begin at the house of God. And that word judgment is the process of judgment that is leading to a decision. It is the process of judgment leading to a decision. So with that definition in mind, let me read it again. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. Now I'm going to save those last three verses there towards the end. Now, go back with me to the beginning of chapter 4 where we started and let's go, and I'm, I'm just going to read very quickly. I'm not going to comment on all of this because of time's sake, but I, I, want, I do need to cover just these few verses. Now, let's start with verse number 3. Well, you can't just do that. Verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our lives, 
for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He's talking about the fact this is what we were before we were born again. So he said, arm yourselves with the same mind that Jesus had, and he suffered in the flesh. And if you have something that you would like to, um, to write on, I'm going to give you some scripture because it, I just, I'm going to see what the Lord wants to do and if, how much of these we will read. But in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, he, he talks about the fact that he said, the one who called you is holy. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16. He says, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy. So be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And remember, in the King James, the word conversation is not the manner of speech, but conversation is your manner of life. It is all about your whole life, not just the way you speak. So the first Peter chapter 1 begins with the call to be holy. For God is holy. The one who called you is holy. But in first Peter chapter 4, he says that, that, that the man who is filled with the Spirit, verse 2, that he should... not no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And it is the will of God for us to be holy as he is holy. For because the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Now listen to the words. Listen to the words that he is using. He says you've been called out of darkness. You've been brought into this marvelous light. You used to live a certain way. You, you, were, you, you lived a life of lasciviousness. That's just excessive lust and excess of wine and revelings and banquetings and abominable idolatries. That was how you lived before. And now the people that you used to run with, now they're wondering, what in the world happened to you? How come you don't do this anymore? They think it's strange that you don't run with them anymore. Now, now, um, in their riot, in their, their, their excessive riot, now they're speaking evil of you. How about it, Sister Becky? Any of your former family members speak evil of the way you live now because you don't run with them anymore? Now you don't participate in that lifestyle anymore. And now they, they, they may treat you like you have the plague. That might not be so bad. But sometimes it's family that does that. Sometimes it's, it's loved ones that we care a lot about that now keep us at arm's length because of the way we live, that we don't run with the same crowd we used to run with. We don't go to the same places. We don't act the same way. And now they think, well, you're, you're um, well, I'll use it like this, Sister Bertha better than you. That come from a Ray Stevens song, by the way. The Mississippi Squirrel Revival. Sister Bertha better than you. That's how they view us, Mr. Self-Righteous. I, I know I'm telling the truth right now because the people in the world, they really like comfort from crowds around them because it makes them feel better. And so when, they, when their crowd dwindles down because of, the, of God filling people with the Holy Ghost and drawing their crowd out of that group, now, now they start feeling isolated and alienated because now the conviction is starting to work on them. And oh, brother, when conviction starts, you know how it feels even now. Very uncomfortable, isn't it not? Isn't it not? I say that right? It's very uncomfortable at times. So now they start, you've got to take the heat off of somebody. 
going to take it off of themselves. They're going to put the heat on you. And now, they, now they're speaking evil of you. But look at verse 5. He said, they're going to give account to the Lord for what they're doing. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. It doesn't matter if they're living or dead. God is going to judge them all. And verse 6 says, for, for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. These are people who heard the gospel before they died. So it really doesn't matter if they are living now or if they're dead now. At some point in time, all of those people will be brought to a place of judgment and they will give an account. But the end of all things is at hand. Can somebody at least say amen to that. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober. Be vigilant. And watch unto prayer. And above all things. This is the ministry of the saints by the way. In case you didn't recognize what, what this is. This is the ministry of the saints. And above all things. Verse 8. Have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You know you can overlook a lot love somebody doesn't mean you're accepting what they're doing but love does cover a multitude of sins verse 9 says use hospitality one to another without grudging okay you can come over and eat dinner with us no that's not what it means it means hospitality means that you invite people Hello, house to house. I'm giving it away week by week where we're going with this. In case you haven't guessed it by now. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift. This is charisma. This is charisma is the result of grace. And you find you know that because the very next line says, um, as every man hath received the gift, whatever that gift is that God has given you, it's a result of grace. Even so, minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom he prays and dominion forever and ever Amen. All right. I had to run through that quickly. But this is where we're going. We started out with, with verse 1 where he said, As Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. If you want to write this down, Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Verse 29 of that passage, Philippians 1, 27 through 30 says, for unto you, he's talking to the saints. Read the whole chapter 1 of Philippians. Talking to the saints. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. Hmm. I don't remember signing up for that. But according to the Apostle Paul, when we were born again, it was... We, we were given the opportunity to believe in Christ, but not only to believe in Him, but to suffer for His sake. Because as Christ suffered in the flesh, because of His suffering in the flesh, He was glorified in the Spirit. That's Philippians chapter 2. And this is what Peter was referring to in 1 Peter chapter 1. Arm yourselves with the same mind that Christ had. For he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now hold on a second. Look at Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you. What mind? The one that was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Humbled himself and became obedient unto death, 
even the death of the cross. That's the mind that we have to arm ourselves with. As Christ suffered for us in the flesh, so we are going to have to suffer in the flesh. If we are the body of Christ, if we are going to bear the title of Christian into the end times, until the coming of the Lord. If Christ suffered, what makes us think that we, the body of Christ, are not going to suffer? It's not going to happen. We will not get off scot-free. You know, I remember growing up as a child, listening to those, those men that would come through, and they, um, I don't know, some of you may remember Brother Solomon. I believe his last name was Solomon, Brother Baldwin. Maybe you remember. But he had this huge chart and timelines of everything that was going to happen in the, in the book of Revelation. And all I could think of was, man, Jesus is going to come, and I ain't got to worry about, I ain't. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Little did I know, it doesn't matter what's going to happen in the tribulation, the great tribulation. It doesn't matter because we're going to go through our own persecution before that day ever gets here. And when that realization starts hitting home, especially when all of your life you've dreamed and lived for the coming of the Lord so you can escape trouble. Little did we know, Brother Wallace, that by being born again of the water and the Spirit, we were just inviting trouble. Hello, somebody. So Jesus... Being found in fashion as a man, just like you and me, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Verse 9 starts with a wherefore. As a result of the previous verses, God also had highly exalted him. How could he be exalted unless he first suffered death? As a Christian, exactly, this is exactly what Peter is writing to us in 1 Peter chapter 4. This is what's going to happen. I realize not all of us will lose our life as a child of God, but some of us will. However many are here on this Wednesday night, out of this group, it's very possible that a percentage of us will die before the coming of the Lord because of persecution. I'm not preaching gloom and doom. I'm just telling you what the reality is of the Scripture. Am I willing to bear the title Christian? Am I willing to live a life that pleases my Father and glorify my Father who is in heaven, glorify Him in the earth because of the way I live by what I, not, I don't know, how do I say this? By following the will of my Father, I'm in flesh, and I'm on the earth, and so I'm going to do stuff, I'm going to say things, I'm going to go places to fulfill the will of my Father. Am I willing to do those things, say those things, go to those places, be who He called me to be, and let them pin on me the title of a Christian and know that because I bear that name, I am marked with a crosshair on my chest and it could very well cost me my life in the process. So if Jesus had that mind he was, in, he was in the form of God but yet he thought it not robbery to be equal with God but still he made himself of no reputation. And because of that God hath highly exalted him given him a name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow things in heaven things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father and God how could that happen unless he first suffer and die what is that Jesus taught that that parable he said unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die it what it abideth alone with the ball and you know you can go to the feed store and buy a package of seeds and then nothing will ever happen until you take that seed and bury it somewhere dark in obscurity and over time that seed dies and 
breaks open. A little sprout comes out, and over time, that plant becomes a bush or maybe a tree, but it becomes something that produces fruit. If that seed never is able to die, it will abide alone. But if it dies, it bringeth forth much fruit. Same principle. The exact same principle. How will God ever be able to exalt us? How will He ever be able to resurrect us and set us on those seats in heavenly places with Him that He has promised to put us on thrones and dominions? How will He ever be able to do that unless we are first able to die? Okay, now I'm talking not literally but spiritually, but to die spiritually has got to be the very first part of this dying process because if I can ever die out to my own self, then I'm not going to be afraid to die physically. What did Paul say? He says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. He said, I don't know. It's, it's good for me to be here, to stay here, to preach and to teach and to train you. He said, but to die is gain. To live is, is, is good, but to die is gain. I didn't plan on going down this particular part of the path tonight, but this is, this is good stuff. We need to wake up to the reality that we are the body of Christ. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat this. From now until Jesus is done with this series and we move on to something else. But ladies and gentlemen, we, we are the body of Christ. There is no plan B. For some of you who follow football, you remember that there was that plan B free agency. Brother Barber, you probably remember this back in the 80s and 90s. Plan B free agency. I'm sorry, we don't have that option. We don't have the option to for free agency. Sorry. Some people may believe that they are a free moral agent. Let me just tell you right now, you're not free. Even if you're not, even if you're not a child of God, you are still not free. But even if you are a child of God, guess what? You're not your own. You are bought with a price. So there is no other options. God has laid it out for us that the Son of God was our supreme example. God in flesh, living and walking on the earth, ministering to people. He picked out a chosen group of followers to train the rest of us on the earth. Peter, James, and John, and then Paul, and, and Apollos, and, and others. Jesus ascended to heaven and then gave us the promise of the Father so that now those of us who have received that promise, now we are His body in the earth. Our head is in heaven. And the head tells the body what to do. And Jesus said, if you don't do what the Father is saying, then I'm going to tell you on that day, depart from me. I don't even know who you are. Now, verse 12. I'm, 1 Peter 4, 12. I'm like a hurry. So he's, he's, he began the chapter with, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same mind. For that purpose, he said, that he no longer should live the rest of his time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, before we move on, if we have to continue this, we will. I'm just going to just going to follow the Holy Ghost. In verse 1, there is a phrase there that I failed to, to tell you or to touch on it. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh, stop, that suffering in the flesh is because 
of who Christ was. He suffered because of who he was and what he represented. Peter is telling you and me to arm ourselves with the same mind that Jesus had. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. What does that mean? This should be probably some of the most exciting material that you have heard all week long. Some of the most. Because Brother Baldwin, that scripture says that if I am suffering some kind of persecution in my flesh, then I have ceased from deliberate and presumptuous sin. Does that mean anything? It means, to me, it is telling me that if I am being attacked either naturally or if I'm being attacked spiritually, it's because the Holy Ghost is having its perfect work inside of me and something is changing inside. I'm now, I'm not the same creature I used to be. I've been, he's been working on me since 1975. And so, yes, yes, I personally, my mind is being attacked. Our home was touched early this morning. I'm going to tell you right now that that was not natural. That was a spiritual attack, even though it was in the body, yet it was a spiritual attack. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the desire of our heart is to follow after God, to find His will and do His will. And Peter said, if you're suffering, it's because you're doing something right. That you should no longer live the rest of your time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. And trust me, right now, your adversary and my adversary has no interest in you and I doing the will of God. So if he can make life hard on you and me to the point that I will say or you will say, you know what, this is not worth it. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 a few months back when we started teaching along these lines. That was the problem that the Hebrews Christians were having in chapter 10. They were being persecuted and they were thinking about apostatizing and walking back and going against God and saying, you know what, this is for the birds. I'm going to go back to being just a good old Jew. Keep the law Go through the rituals of all of that because I was not suffering any persecution there. Why? Why were they not? Because what they were doing was not affecting anything in the spirit realm. Just keeping the rules. Doing the do's and not doing the don'ts. Y'all heard that before, right? That's pointless. We already know that flesh can't keep the law. We already know that just keeping the rules is not enough because we can't keep the rules. You ever roll through a stop sign? You ever exceed the speed limit? I realize those are just carnal examples, but that's just the nature of flesh to rebel. Holy cow. Sorry, I promised I wouldn't say that no more, Lord. There is no cow that is holy. And the Lord convicted me of that. I'll just be real honest with you. Sonny James. The nature of flesh is to rebel. Right? So Peter says that if you are suffering, he said, go ahead and get the same mind that Christ had. He, he, he wasn't just coping with it. Matter of fact, what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus Christ actually died. Because when it came to the cross, he just went there because he died in the garden. His will became lost in the blood, sweat, and tears in the garden. And When he got up from there, it was to go do the will of the Father. And it didn't matter what was before him because... He had already died to the will of his his flesh. 
we no longer live the rest of our time to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Now, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Actually, 1 Peter begins, chapter 1, verse 7, says this. He said that the trial of your faith, being much more precious of gold, than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with what? Fire. Your faith might be found unto praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 4, verse 12, he says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning this fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. Well, is there anybody else that will get honest with me? Okay, my name's Ronald. I have a problem. I don't like to suffer. And when I suffer, sometimes I pout. You said that just a little too loud. Sometimes I get mad. I get little bit irritated with God and I sulk and I wonder why is this happening to me well trust me right now when I tell you that's not the mind of Christ that's the mind of Ronald David but Peter said we should arm ourselves with the same mind that Jesus had. If I'm a son of God, then I've got to have his mind. And trust me when I tell you this, it, it, is, it is a process. It's, it's not just like you, you flip a switch. It's not like these lights. They're off. Then you turn the switch on and they come on and all of a sudden, I got the mind of Christ. Ooh, glory to God. Shondo. I borrowed that from somebody. It's not like that. I got to, I have to die. Oh, I have another problem. I don't want to die. My flesh doesn't want to die, Brother Bowen. It wants to live. It wants to be in charge. It wants to, it wants to be in the forefront of all the decisions that are made. And Peter is telling us, no, if you're, if you're suffering as a, as a Christian, then you need to have this mind of Christ that says, beloved, that says to the Lord, I'm not going to think it strange when I am tested with a fiery trial as though some strange thing is happening to me. But rejoice in as much as you are what? Partakers of Christ's sufferings. If, if you're like me in any shape or form, then you will, you will have to be honest and say that this is not how we've lived. We, I'm going to say we, uh, we, have li we, have, we have not lived according to this for the majority of our lives. Because what do we want in the here and the now? We want luxury. We want to kick back, we want to retire with a, with a nice pension. Somehow when we retire, we think we retire from the kingdom of God and we can just relax and go do our own thing and everything's just going to be fine. God's going to just excuse all of that nonsense. It's not the way it's going to be. That's what we want. But he said, we are to rejoice when we are partakers of Christ, sufferings, plural. Write down Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Read 
that was Jesus went to the cross ignoring the shame, despising the shame, I'm sorry, because he could see the glory that was beyond it. That when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So what are we living for? Are we living for the present? Are we living for when that day comes when Jesus' glory will be revealed from heaven? Because if we live to see that day or if we at least die in the faith and when he comes, his glory is revealed then we will be glad with exceeding joy. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you. Blessed are you if you are reviled for his name's sake. For because the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. This again, John 16 and 17. Write those down and read those two chapters. John 16 and 17. And on their part, the part of those who are reviling and reproaching you. The Lord Jesus is evil spoken of, but on your part, because they are reviling you, because you are suffering for the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus is glorified. But don't suffer as a murderer, thief, evildoer, or a, bus a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if, if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now, where did this come from? This comes from the book of Ezekiel, chapters 8 and 9. I'm not going to read it, but I am going to, to, to brush it so that I can make the, the final point. In Ezekiel chapter 8, the Bible says the children of, of Israel or Judah, the southern kingdom, had been taken captive by the Babylonians. And I don't know at what point... There's dates given in chapter 8, how long they had been in captivity already. The Bible says that Ezekiel was taken up in a vision. And in a vision, God took him to Jerusalem, to the temple. And he took him down inside the temple and he told him, he said, look towards the north. And there was a door, a gate towards the north there in the temple in Jerusalem. And he told him to look, and he, when he looked towards the north, he saw the image of jealousy. One of the kings, I believe it was Manasseh, had taken an image and actually put an idol god inside the temple itself towards the north end of that courtyard. And in that, in, he set Ezekiel down there, and he said, you see that? He said, do you see what they do here? He said, just, just come with me. I'm going to show you something. It even it gets worse. And he took him to another point inside. The, it was actually there in the temple itself where you go from the outer court into that inner court or into the tabernacle itself between the porch and the altar. Between the porch and the altar. And he said, he said I want you to look. In, 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 he said, there's a hole in the wall. Look, and what do you see? He said, I see a door. He told him to dig through the wall. And he entered into this room. And there were 70 men inside this room. And on the walls of this room were every imaginable idol god that they had inscribed onto the walls of this temple. Inside, between the porch and the altar. God's house. These 70. They represented the people. Remember what God told Moses to do when the people became too much? He told Moses to choose out 70 men. Those 70 men represented the whole body, the whole group of Israel. And he says, these men are inside here. And they are, they had, there was one man, probably a priest, and they were offering incense inside of this room where all of these idol gods had been inscribed on the walls. And he said, you know what? It even gets worse. And he carried him to another part. 
to the inner court at the door of the temple. Between, this is between the porch and the altar. I have them backwards. And there were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. What does it mean when you turn your back on somebody? It means I don't have anything for you. And you show them your back. That's the ultimate slap in the face. These 25 men had their backs to the temple. And they had their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun. S-U-N. He says, hast thou seen this, O man of God? And these 25 men represented the priesthood. You seen this? So come on, I'm going to show you something else. It just gets worse. He led him to another part, and there were women. He brought him to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women women weeping for Tammuz. Who is Tammuz? Tammuz is the god of vegetation or the god of vegetation or supply, I believe. They had turned their backs completely on the worship of God, and they were doing this in the temple of God. Chapter 9 is very disturbing because this, this image that picked Ezekiel up and carried him to the temple now cries with a loud voice in chapter 9, and he says, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Now these were people who had charge of the city. These were people who had authority. And there were six of these men, and he said, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And six men came. And then there was a seventh. And this seventh man had a writer's ink horn by his side. And they came in and stood by the brazen altar. And the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord got up off of the mercy seat. If you studied the tabernacle plan, you know that the mercy seat was where God dwelt in that time in the temple. So when the priest would go in and offer the blood on the mercy seat, if God was pleased with the sacrifice, the glory of God would come down on that mercy seat. And so that is where God was to Israel. And the Bible says that 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 Spirit of God got up off the mercy seat and walked to the door. The mercy seat. Mercy is when you, it's what you get. It's what you get when you don't deserve it. So God got, got up off the mercy seat and then walked to the door. This is a sign of judgment. And he tells the man with the with the ink horn and the linen garments, he said, I want you to go through the go through the city of Jerusalem. But he said, But you start first of all at my house. And you make a mark. You take that pen and you make a mark on the forehead of every person that is sighing and crying because of the wickedness that's in the city, that's in the wickedness that's in Israel. You make a mark on them that are crying and sighing because of evil. Put a mark on them. Then he told those six, he says, now you follow the one with the ink horn and every man upon whom does not have the mark. You utterly slay and destroy male, female, child. It didn't matter if they didn't have that mark on their forehead. Kill them. You see what this boils down to. Is faithfulness. Because you see, Israel was in bondage in Babylon because of their unfaithfulness. But God left people in Jerusalem to keep the, or they left people, uh, Nebuchadnezzar left people there to keep up the temple, to keep up the walls, to keep up the crops, to keep doing whatever they were doing. But these people that stayed behind decided, you know what? God has forsaken us. When you read this, you will read this because, and you will, you will see where they said that God had forsaken the earth. 
God hadn't forsaken the earth. His law was still in effect. He still expected people to live and walk by faith. So this boils down to faithfulness. Even in the harshest of circumstances, even though the bulk of Israel had been, or the bulk of Judah had been taken to Babylon, God expected the people left behind to continue to go to temple, to keep the law of Moses, to offer the sacrifices. But instead of doing that, they turned the temple into a place for idols. And God was thoroughly displeased with this. So he sent these destroyers, these destroyers, into the city of Jerusalem to kill everybody that didn't have the mark. And even in suffering, hardships, tribulation, God expects His people, hear me right now, God expects you and I to continue to serve Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Even with suffering, God is judging, evaluating His people, and He will not spare if there is unfaithfulness. The point is this. When Peter quoted this from Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9, the point he's making in 1 Peter chapter 4 for you and I is that faithfulness is everything. If I'm suffering right now, then I need to be faithful arm myself with the mind of Christ because what do you think suffering is doing right now brother barber he's not doing it just to hurt us he's evaluating his church covid-19 you think that's an accident whether you, whatever you believe or where it came from or how it got to the United States, whatever you believe about that, it's immaterial. It never got here unless God allowed it to be here. Any reason why it's here? Not just to kill people, not just to make our lives miserable. God is evaluating His people. And persecution that is coming on the church is going to continue until Jesus comes. And that evaluation, that is a judgment leading to a decision. And what decision is God going to make about you and I? Will we have that mark on us, whatever that mark looks like? And some commentators believe that that man with the linen ink horn is the Son of God. And those six destroyers are those other six spirits of God. Wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Those things are going to evaluate God's people. And so the, it boils down to this, and I, I'm hurrying to a close, I promise I am. Suffering as a Christian is no excuse for unfaithfulness. Patience and long-suffering will sustain us through God's grace and favor. It doesn't matter what we, are, what we face now or what we will face in the future. Are we going to stand up to the evaluation process? Are we going to be found at the end with that mark on us that says, that's one of my children, get your hands off, leave them alone. When that destroyer comes into the land, with those destroying weapons in his hand, what is he going to say about you and I? And then he says, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the sinner and the ungodly appear? That word scarcely doesn't mean just barely by the skin of our teeth. It means with great difficulty. I wish I could tell you that the end of time and living for God and, and serving the Lord and honoring His kingdom is going to be a piece of cake. Soak in a bowl of milk. It's not going to happen. Between now and the time Jesus comes, the righteous are just scarcely going to be saved. Again, not barely, but with great difficulty. And the last verse says this, Wherefore, 
as a result of all of these other verses, let them that suffer according to the will of God. What does that next word say? Commit. That word, it means to deposit. The keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So he says, for those who are suffering according to the will of God, how are you going to save your soul? By depositing your soul into the one who keeps it. Putting your soul into the hands of the Lord by this one thing. In well doing. Bottom line, faithfulness. Whatever God has called you to do and you're doing it now with, with some hardship, with some difficulty. The scriptures are telling us that God expects us to keep doing it when it becomes great persecution. And you will be depositing your soul into the one who can keep it if you are willing to keep doing what is right. So I ask this question. What is it that you truly desire? A life of ease and luxury, a temporal existence, heaven on earth, and then an eternity of pain and suffering? Or would you prefer to suffer with Christ now for 70 years? Endure pain and hardships with the blessing and favor of God and exchange it for eternal bliss in heaven. My choice is to suffer with him now so that I can reign with him then. Because how was Jesus glorified? Only after he suffered. The ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. Everything. What does the scripture say? He told us, take up your cross daily and follow me. Paul said, I die daily. That's about what it amounts to. You take up your cross every single day. This is dying out to the will of flesh and will, dying out to selfish desires and saying to the Father, I'm dead to myself. I'll go, I'll do, I'll be, I'll say. Whatever that amounts to. Would you close your eyes with me? I, I apologize, it's 820. Would you close your eyes with me for just a moment here before we dismiss? Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I beseech you by your mercy and grace that you will talk to our hearts through this word. Father, I loosed the gift of faith in this room already today, and I believe that that gift of faith is quickening this word to their hearts, that you're writing it, inscribing it on the inside. God, this is not something we take into our intellect, not just our minds and our thought process, but Lord, this is something that has to be engraved into the inner man. And so Lord, I am praying right now by your spirit that you will engrave this inside of every one of us, that, God, we are willing to accept the responsibility that I'm going to suffer for a Christian as a Christian. God, if the world looks at me in disdain and they call me after this term a Christian and they call me that, Lord, derogatorily, so be it, Lord, that I may suffer with you now. And if I suffer with you now, then I will be glorified with you then, Father. So in the name of Jesus, God, I'm saying for myself, as for me and my house, Lord, we accept this call. We accept the ministry of the saints, Lord, to be, to go, do, be, and say, Lord, whatever your kingdom requires. 
Whatever your will is, God, we are committing the keeping of our souls to you, Lord, as a faithful creator. That what you have said, you will do. What you have promised, you will fulfill. And God, by faith, I receive this word. By faith, Lord, I speak this and I commend it to their hearts and their minds as well, Father. I bless you. I praise you. I thank you, Master, in the name of the Lord Jesus. And God, we give all the glory, the honor to you for giving us this privilege, this opportunity to hear and receive what the Spirit would say. Thank you, Father. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for um, coming out on this rainy evening. May the Lord richly bless you. Go in God's grace in Jesus' name. Amen.